Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines: Rival Libyan groups meet in Morocco to discuss extension of ceasefire. In Bolivia, Constitutional Court denies candidacy to Evo Morales for the upcoming elections. In its final verdict, Saudi court jails eight accused in Jamal Khashoggi murder. Social movements in Haiti denounce government complicity in recent massacre. And the union NUMSA and COMER reach settlement over employee medical cover. We begin with Libya, where on Sunday, representatives of the two rival governing factions met to begin peace talks. The meeting was held in Morocco's coastal town of Bozinka. Called the Libyan Dialogue, the objective of the talks is to discuss the mechanisms to prolong the ceasefire declared around two weeks earlier by both the governing bodies. The discussions were a prelude to another meeting in Switzerland to be held on Monday and Tuesday that brings together top leaders of Lib uh, rival Libyan groups. The talks in Switzerland are sponsored by the United Nations Support Mission in Libya and the European Union and will include all factions and political groups in Libya. It is expected to decide the fate of the ceasefire and the nitty-gritty of the proposed elections. The Moroccan Foreign Minister emphasized that Libyans themselves should decide the solution to the problem. Morocco was also the host of the talks between Libyan parties in 2015, which led to the creation of the Government of National Accord. In the past, external intervention by different countries supporting different rival factions have further intensified the war. Despite the UN arms embargo since 2011, both the rival governments have been able to procure weapons. The present conflict in the country began when the chaos created by the overthrow and assassination of long-term ruler Muammar Gaddafi in a NATO led invasion in 2011. We next go to Bolivia, where on Monday the candidacy of former Bolivian President Evo Morales in the October 19th elections was disqualified by a constitutional court in the capital La Paz. Last February, Bolivia's Supreme Electoral Court had also ruled against his candidacy, stating that he was no longer a resident in the country. Following the coup in November 2019, Evo had travelled to Mexico and then to Argentina as a de facto government issued several arrest warrants against him. Evo's defence said that they will continue to appeal to the plurinational constitutional court, although the legal procedures will cross the October 19th election date. This is the first time in 23 years that Evo Morales is disqualified from an electoral campaign since his entry into it in 1997. Despite the setbacks, polls show that the MAS party, which is Morales' party, remains the largest political force in Bolivia and that their candidate for the presidency, Luis Arce, is set to win in most of the departments or provinces. We now go to Saudi Arabia where on Monday a court revised the sentences of all the eight convicted persons to the Jamal Khashoggi murder trial. Overturning, overturning the death sentence for five of the convicts, the revised sentences were reduced to 20-year prison sentences. Three others were given sentences ranging from 7 to 10 years in jail. This is after Jamal Khashoggi's son stated in May that they had pardoned the killers of, of their father. However, Hatish Chengiz, Khashoggi's partner, called the court ruling a farce, tweeting that the Saudi authorities are closing the case without the world, knowing the truth of who was responsible for his death. Jamal Khashoggi was a US-based Saudi journalist working for the Washington Post. He has been critical of the Saudi ruling classes and particularly the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Several Western investigative agencies have concluded that Prince Salman and other high-ranking officials in the Saudi government had a role in the killing of the dissident journalist. The Saudi government, however, has denied the allegations. The body of the slain 59-year-old journalist was never recovered. Investigators said that it could have been dissolved in acid after the murder. In our next story, Haitian social activists have raised their voices denouncing the inaction of the government in dealing with the massacre in Belar. On the 31st of August, a group of armed men set fire to houses and attacked people in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Belar in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. The attack took the lives of over 20 people. The attacks continued on the 2nd of September, where criminal gang members returned at night. The inhabitants have reported that the national police had three armed tanks to protect the actions of the gang members and facilitating the massacre and burning of several homes. This has further strengthened the allegation that the gang worked for the government. Days after the massacre, the victims still continued to search for their loved ones who had disappeared in the attack. After the massacre, the protests, people took to the streets to protest against the president, Jean Almoise. The Belar massacre and several other massacres perpetrated in the city's poor neighbourhoods are a series of operations that are very similar to acts committed by US troops in the country during the time of the occupation of 1915 to 1934. On Monday, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, announced that they have reached a settlement with Comair on the issue of medical cover for employees. The company has agreed to reinstate employees' medical cover, which it had previously decided to stop paying from September 1st. Following this, the union withdrew its application from court. Representing the majority of Comair employees, NUMSA had initially filed an urgent application to the Labour Court on September 3rd. NUMSA has nonetheless clarified that it may have to return to court if the negotiations with the company's management over the issue of unpaid salaries fail to reach a resolution. The union said that the company has enforced unpaid leave on workers since the 1st of June. The company had earlier claimed that a halting of flights following the lockdown had led to a financial crisis 
and they expected to start their services by December. And finally, as the extradition hearings with Julian Assange continues, writer Vijay Prashad talks to musician Roger Waters on the trial and many other issues around it. Uh, when did you first encounter Julian Assange and perhaps his work? Uh, what drew you to, in other words, the story of Julian Assange? Well, if, if I'm... This may be the truth. Um, the collateral murder images are, are probably because that was through Chelsea Manning that was the sort of the first time really that something so black and white, but also gripping, uncontestable. Actually, that's not true. Abu Ghraib came before the collateral murder videos. Abu Ghraib was the same thing. It was showing that the United States empire was actually the Third Reich personified. The, 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 those still photographs that came out of Amu Grape were kind of like the, the they were like the prequel to, to the uh, collateral murder video when it came out. But when the video, when the video came out, like there it was suddenly right in front of us. And um, that was in 2007, was it? Or, no, 2007 was the incident and the images didn't come out till 2010. Well, they came out just in time for me to put them in the war show, which I started touring in October 2010 in Toronto and Canada. And I finished on September the 13th in the Stade de France in Paris, three years later. So for three years, I was showing the collateral murder video during a song of mine called Run Like Hell every single night that we were on stage. Could you quickly, just very quickly describe the video? Because, I mean, I think this is compulsory viewing for everybody, but yeah. it would be a good idea to describe it a little and how you used it in the show. Well, um, it's a black and white video and it is shot from Apache, two different, I believe, Apache attack helicopters armed with Hellfire missiles and... 30 caliber, I think 30 caliber um, machine guns. And the audio is the young, I assume young um, American airmen manning these craft who have been reduced by the servitude to the military and to the Pentagon and to the White House and whatever to bloodthirsty automatons with no empathy or feeling for other human beings. That is one of the really important things about that. So you see them and you hear them talking to each other and they're desperate to be given permission to kill people on the ground. In order to get that permission, they have to pretend that the people on the ground are a danger to them in their Apache helicopters flying around, armed to the fucking teeth. Two of the men on the ground are Reuters cameramen, uh, Saeed and I've forgotten the other guy's name. And Namir, so, Namir and Saeed. Yeah. So, so Lamir and Saeed. So they're carrying cameras or one of them is and whatever. And there may, there may be, when you look very carefully at this, there might, you might see somebody carrying a, an AK-47 50 yards down the street, or some, somebody has an arm, definitely. Or what. But on, on the grounds of this flimsy notion that these people might be dangerous in some way, they eventually get the water order, light them all up. So they kill everybody in sight. They kill maybe 13 people. And they don't just kill them, they destroy them. There's very little left of them. And then one guy is wounded and crawls up behind a wall and they follow, they're desperate to kill him. And they follow, he's, he's, he's been hit by at least two 30 millimeter. 30 millimeters is a thing like that. They've gone through him. He's obviously dying anyway. And they finally get shot, so they murder him. Then some good Samaritan comes up in a Thames 500 weight van to help him to help this guy, to, in case he's not completely dead. 
So they opened fire on the van. There happened to be two kids in the van who were both injured in the attack. And the driver is killed, I believe, but not. But so here is a graphic, absolute graphic. This is like me lie captured on film and brought into your living room so that you can't say, I don't believe it, or that's unlikely. Oh, it's Seymour Hirsch. What does he know about anything? Well, he knows a lot about a lot because he's, he's another dedicated journalist who tries to tell the truth about things. So there it was, suddenly irrefutable evidence of a heinous and hideous war crime. And what have they done? What do they do? They crucified Chelsea Manning. And she's still being crucified, and they'll go on crucifying her for the rest of her life. It didn't go without notice that the appalling judge, um, in, in her recent hearing, when she was finally let out of prison, let her out of prison, but said, you still have to pay the $260,000 fine. That's 260 days, it's $1,000 a day that you incurred by refusing to give evidence to a grand jury, illegal grand jury set up to crucify Julian Assange, who, if you like, was, was her comrade in the... Uh, it's the exposing of a war crime. It's not really, though, it's the reporting of a war crime. That is his job as a journalist and her job as a human being, even though at the time she was in the service of the American armed forces. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,